Um, good afternoon to all, all of you who have gathered here for our very first uh, uh, lecture organized by the SLM Expert Committee on Medical Rehabilitation. SLM Expert Committee on Medical Rehabilitation is the arm of the Sri Lanka Medical Association that conducts activities particularly in relation to medical rehabilitation. We uh, have the uh, uh, members representing all uh, areas of the multidisciplinary team uh, that is uh, needed for uh, medical rehabilitation. Uh, so it conducts many types of activities and this is the very first activity for this year. So let me, uh, on behalf of the committee, very warmly welcome all of you, uh, I mean, who are here, gathered here at the SLMA auditorium, as well as uh, all others who have joined online for this uh, important uh, talk uh, organized by the uh, uh, committee. Uh, right, um, so now uh, our very first talk, as you know, would be on a neurological topic. It is uh, on novel therapies in Parkinson's disease rehabilitation. So you know that uh, how common Parkinson's is about 20% uh, of people more than eight years of age are uh, with Parkinson's disease. They all need rehabilitation, but uh, there isn't uh, much of uh, attention or much of interest on rehabilitation of these patients in general here in Sri Lanka. So there is so much that for us to concentrate uh, on the aspect of rehabilitation of this uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, I'm very glad that uh, I was able to convince Dr. Nadisha Kalyani to talk on this important topic. I have been knowing Nadisha now for about, almost for about a decade, and uh, from the time that she was a student, and now she is uh, a qualified academic, and she is a senior lecturer attached to the Department of Allied Health Sciences of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, and also a visiting fellow at Queensland University of Technology, Australia. Uh, she is an associate fellow of the Higher Education Academy and a CEDA qualified academic. Uh, Nadisha has obtained her doctoral degree in the field of neuro rehabilitation at the uh, uh, Queensland University of Technology and her research interests are in the areas of neurological physiotherapy uh, in, and, and uh, biomechanics with a special emphasis on Parkinson's disease, stroke, and spinal cord injuries. So uh, I see Nadisha as a very valuable asset for us in our, uh, I mean, to the neurology community. I'm so grateful to Nadisha for deciding to talk on this important topic. So uh, with that very brief introduction, let me invite Nadisha to commence her presentation. Over to you, Nadisha. Uh, thank you so much, Madam, for this uh, very kind introduction. And um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to uh, thank the SLMA Expert Committee on Medical Rehabilitation for giving me this opportunity. So my um, talk today is on uh, novel therapies in Parkinson's disease rehabilitation. Um, so what is Parkinson's disease? Uh, as you may already know, it's a chronic, incurable, progressive neurodegenerative condition, um, which is caused by the reduction of dopamine synthesis in the substantia nigra of the brain. Um, 
10 million or more people affected with this disease globally, and approximately uh, 70,000 Australians are having this disease. And when you uh, look at the data, uh, the recently uh, published WHO data regarding Sri Lanka, the Parkinson's disease deaths in Sri Lanka reached 168, or 0.14% of the total deaths. Uh, so uh, the Parkinson's disease has a, a broad range of cl clinical features uh, which are categorized as motor and non-motor symptoms. So gait impairment is the distinguishing motor uh, uh, feature that we observe in this condition and the cognitive dysfunction is the main non-motor symptom observed in this disease. So because of these uh, motor and non-motor impairment, the people of Parkinson's disease uh, present with problems in dual tasking. That means uh, doing two things at the same time, such as walking and talking. And also these motor issues are leading to issues in the functional mobility, uh, which are related to problems in walking and balance. And also fine manual dexterity issues are there. And all these things are leading to uh, problems in their habitual physical activities, which ultimately uh, cause them leading a sedentary life. And also, overall, these are leading to a poor quality of life. Uh, so if, uh, the, uh, the, if you look at uh, 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 this gait dysfunction, which is a very uh, prominent uh, clinical feature in this disease, um, this is mainly presented as uh, the first thing is uh, gait slowness and then uh, gait variability and asymmetry and postural instability. So what are the causes for these things? So regarding the gait slowness, it's mainly due to the reduction of the dopamine. There is an overactive inhibitory output from the uh, basal ganglia, which causes the slowness of the gait. And then uh, the reduction of uh, automatic control because uh, we already know that gait is a uh, automatic uh, process in healthy individuals. However, in Parkinson's patients, this becomes attention demanding. Therefore, there is a gait variability and asymmetry present with this condition. And also there is hypokinesia and rigidity, which causes the postural instability. Uh, so this is the uh, normal gait cycle, um, which has a stance phase and a swing phase. And uh, so when we look at the spatiotemporal parameters of uh, the Parkinson's disease gait, so we observe it as a shuffling gait. And regarding the uh, velocity, there is a reduction in the gait velocity and then markedly increased double support time and shorter stride length, shorter step length. However, the cadence is intact. And uh, moving on to the gait kinematics, uh, regarding the joint angular motion, uh, in the stance phase, there is a reduction of knee flexion and extension, reduced hip flexion and extension. And in the swing phase, there is a reduction of ankle dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. So uh, with related to the segmental motion, there is a reduced arm swing, uh, pelvics, pelvis and thorax are rigidly coupled when walking and also there is a increased mediolateral head motion, pelvis motion and trunk motion. Uh, when moving on to the cognition, uh, which is the major non-motor symptom which we observe in this disease, there is a transition from normal cognition, mild cognitive impairment to dementia. Uh, and the researchers uh, argue that the reason for this impairment is mainly due to the disruption in the frontostriatal circuits due to dopamine de de uh, depletion. And uh, so these are the main uh, cognitive skills which are affected in this disease. Attention, executive function, uh, visual spatial function, language, and memory. However, the profound impairment is on executive function, which is... Uh, uh, controlled by the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And as I said before, the dual tasking uh, is affected in this disease. There are a lot of research in this area how the dual tasking is getting affected. Um, so this is a, a, 
a combined effect of uh, gait and cognition, which is controlled by the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And when the gait becomes attention demanding, uh, the uh, dual tasking also becomes uh, uh, problematic in these patients. So overall, these are leading to uh, the reduction in habitual physical activity, uh, which leads to a sedentary lifestyle in these patients. And also ultimately the quality of life, which is a, a patient-based outcome is also getting affected. And again, there is a very uh, uh, strong uh, like uh, research saying that um, the, there is a caregiver burden because most of the time uh, there are the family members are the informal caregivers who are uh, taking care of these uh, patients and the caregiving is becoming extremely challenging task for them. So there is a caregiver burden associated with this condition. Uh, so uh, Parkinson's disease is treated in numerous ways. Um, mainly the drug therapy uh, um, uh, drug therapy using levodopa and dopamine agonist. And under neural interventions, uh, there are neurosurgical interventions uh, such as deep uh, brain stimulation, and then uh, the ultrasound lesions, transcranial direct current stimulation, and spinal cord stimulation, which are uh, exploratory at the moment. So uh, while there is a significant improvement of uh, the uh, debilitating uh, symptoms of this disease with the medication and uh, surgical interventions, uh, a full recovery is highly unlikely, even in patient who receives the best medical care. Therefore, uh, the researchers are um, seeking uh, what are the other therapies that we can um, accomplish uh, these uh, treatments. So, uh, uh, there are supplementary therapies um, in, uh, in the area of allied health treatment, uh, which are the physiotherapy treatments, occupational therapy treatments, and speech therapy uh, uh, are considered as adjunct therapies to medication. So there is a growing uh, body of evidence supporting uh, physiotherapy interventions as uh, adjunct treatment for the medical and surgical treatment to improve the uh, care of these patients with Parkinson's disease. And according to the research, uh, the exercise stimulate dopamine synthesis in the remaining dopaminergic cells and hence reduce the symptoms. And also people with higher level of habitual physical activity are at a lower risk for developing Parkinson's disease. Therefore, uh, there are a lot of uh, physiotherapy interventions, the, uh, the conventional physiotherapy treatments uh, uh, practiced in our rehabilitation settings. So those are gait training, balance and coordination exercises, progressive resistance training, aquatherapy, walking programs, aerobic exercises, Bobat training, neuromuscular facilitation techniques, false prevention techniques, and relaxation techniques. Uh, so despite a relative long history of uh, using these conventional uh, physiotherapy techniques, um, the evidence supporting these treatments are not very strong because sometimes these may not address the underlying uh, deficits of the uh, Parkinson's disease, and sometimes, therefore, uh, the efficacy is partly limited. So, uh, due to that reason, there are some advanced uh, treatment which have been introduced in the past decade, um, and there are a lot of research happening in those areas as well. So one of that is cueing techniques, uh, that is using of uh, external, temporal, or spatial stimuli to facilitate movement, especially for walking, the gait initiation and continuation of gait. So these cues have been hypothesized uh, to bypass the disease basal ganglia by utilizing different pathways. These uh, cues can be of three types, the auditory, visual, and somatosensory. Under auditory cues, uh, the using of rhythmic auditory cues have been researched, and this has found a lot of improvement in patients with this disease. 
And then under visual cues, uh, the key, uh, uh, putting stripes on the floor and asking them to walk on the stripes. And then under somatosensory cues, uh, holding hands in a group class. So these are used in uh, rehabilitation settings. And uh, according to the research, uh, there is immediate and powerful effect on gait um, in Parkinson's disease. Uh, indicating improvement in walking speed, step length, and uh, step frequency. And the other um, um, uh, important intervention uh, which uh, uh, the researchers are focusing is treadmill training. Um, this allows people to practice gait with a higher speed and greater step length because we know the, uh, they have a um, uh, uh, considerable issue with their step length and the gait velocity. Uh, uh, treadmill uh, training with body weight support ha has also been introduced for Parkinson's disease patients. We know that this was a technique which is widely used in uh, uh, stroke and uh, spinal uh, cord injured patients in their early rehabilitation because offloading of their body weight will give them uh, encouragement for walking. However, uh, the recent literature has found that even for Parkinson's disease patients, using a harness uh, when they are walking will give them uh, confidence in walking and also facilitating gait initiation and continuation. So um, again, uh, um, uh, research shows that external cueing are made mediated through proprioceptive and vestibular receptors generate, uh, and it generates repetitive sensory input to the central nervous system, which facilitate the walking. And not only symptom relief, but also this has promoted neuroplasticity. Uh, the, the other uh, advanced technique that we see is the robot assisted gait training. Um, this provides an uh, opportunity uh, uh, to challenge training by enforcing specific kinematic parameters and providing continuous som somatosensory cues because we know that the patient with Parkinson's are unable to generate adequate amplitude of the movement and maintain the internal uh, rhythm of the gait. So with this robot-assisted training, these things can be facilitated. So this has found to reduce the freezing of gait in these patients. And, there, and again, there is a study which compares the robot assisted gait training with treadmill training. And uh, they have found that uh, they have, uh, the robot assisted gait training group has improved not only spatiotemporal uh, parameters, but also the pelvic and hip movements. Again, you might have heard this uh, technique as well, the virtual re reality rehabilitation training. Um, that is a computer animated stimulation of three-dimensional environment. Uh, and it promotes patients, uh, patients' visual, auditory, and tactile input. And uh, this allows the patients to interact uh, with stimulations from the environment via multiple sensory channels. So it's a high intensity task oriented multisensory uh, feedback training. Um, and the patients get the opportunity to experience immersion and non-immersion virtual environment. So again, there, there, there are research findings that show a lot of beneficial effects. So not only uh, the patients achieve the same effect as conventional physiotherapy, but it has better performance on uh, gait and balance. Okay, so, uh, so these are clinic-based interventions. So while these clinic-based interventions or laboratory-based interventions are assisting people in numerous ways to alleviate the symptoms, uh, there are challenges associated with these therapies, especially in terms of long-term adherence. Um, so one of the challenges uh, that are faced by the pe people with Parkinson's disease is how to sustain uh, the exercises over a long period because they will be living with the disease for nearly 30, 25 to 30 years in their life. So it's a very, uh, so there are, uh, so this is a significant challenge uh, that people with Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease are globally facing. So how to, uh, can they attend the class once a week, 
throughout their entire life's lifetime so are they are can they do are they doing the exercises at home which are adequate uh, to gain the uh, appropriate improvement so uh, the so the main challenge uh, related to these uh, clinic based interventions are poor long term adherence and there are a few more things uh, such as physical distress fear of falling dependence on an instructor affordability uh, competing priorities and uh, the belief that uh, exercise was not essential and not helpful therefore uh, the researchers are seeking more novel community based therapies that facilitate uptake and enjoyment therefore there are some uh, uh, during the past two decades actually uh, there are uh, some more community based novel treatments have appeared and uh, especially uh, the boxy um, which we uh, uh, which is a, a high intensity therapeutic exercise so um, this is this is uh, this is new to sri lankan setting but if you look at the global literature there are a lot of studies uh, showing the importance of this boxing uh, uh, it's a goal based activity um, and uh, uh, according to research findings uh, boxing can be um, engaging and accessible for people with chronic disease and um, um, researchers argue that um, uh, the this uh, um, intervention slow the rate of the disease progression by promoting neuroplasticity so what happens with boxing um, it uh, increase increase the strength improve the hand eye coordination improve posture better cognitive processing stronger core which can lead to better gait uh, improve balance and agility and improve reaction time and again tai chi which is uh, which is a type of martial arts uh, so this is uh, again uh, is a balance exercise and also uh, there are similarities uh, with aerobic exercise that we use in traditional rehabilitation programs so this combines deep breathing and relaxation with slow and gentle movements and improve balance control flexibility and muscular strength and reduces the risk of falls so studies suggest that it may also improve axial symptoms of parkinson's disease such as postural instability Uh, the next is dance therapy. So dance therapy also has become an emerging management option uh, for Parkinson's disease. Um, so since I became a part of um, uh, a research project on dance of Parkinson's, I will talk a little bit deep into this area and I will share some of the research findings as well. Uh, so if you look at the literature uh, during past 20 years, you will see there is a growing interest uh, in this area of dance for Parkinson's. So this is a systematic review and a meta-analysis that we published. So you can read this paper if you are interested. So what is dance? Um, so uh, one might think, um, so can this be uh, a, a, a suitable intervention for Parkinson's disease? Can people with Parkinson's disease dance? So there are questions that might come to your mind. Even I was thinking the same when I started uh, working on this area. So dance uh, is a, a fundamental uh, form of individual and group human expression and it organizes body movements into a, a sequence of spatial patterns that form trajectory map of the body in exotic space. So dance has been used in the past as a therapeutic intervention and the first use was uh, for a group of psychiatric individuals in 1947. And the first use of dance as an intervention for Parkinson's disease was in 1989. So uh, uh, why dance is considered a therapeutic exercise? So non dance uses a num number of attentional cues such as visual, auditory and somatosensory. So the music which is used in the dance is acting as a very strong auditory cue. 
and also when seeing the instructor's performance and also when dancing in a group, when, when seeing others dancing, it provides visual cue. And also when holding hands in a dance class, it is a kind of a somatosensory uh, feedback. Um, and also this incorporates functional movements that people with Parkinson's disease find difficult to perform, such as gliding, marching. So these things are uh, difficult for Parkinson's patients, and we include these things in our exercise programs. And some of these dance have been already used as balanced exercises in our rehabilitation programs, su such as uh, placing one foot in, the in front and a single uh, leg uh, stance. So these are already used in our exercise programs. And uh, dance uses uh, specific muscles of the body, therefore uh, it enhances uh, the strength and can be considered as a strengthening exercise. And dance involves dual tasking uh, because one must maintain balance against the perturbations of the environment while performing complicated dance steps, hand, eye, uh, hand uh, and foot coordination patterns. So this is a sort of a dual tasking. And if you dance with specific intensity, it is a form of, aerob form of aerobic exercise. And also dance synchronizes complex movement patterns to a musical beat. So uh, the, the person must practice motor and cognitive skills. Uh, so memory is improving and a lot of cogn cognitive skills are improving. Execution of dance pattern involves motor planning and memory. And improvisation, that is the uh, creation, crea creating the spontaneous movement patterns. Uh, so that is much more challenging than performing a set of prescribed instructions. And then encouraging uh, dancers uh, to express their feelings. Uh, because uh, in Parkinson's disease, the psychological uh, symptoms are very evident, uh, the anxiety and depression, and there are research findings uh, showing that dance helps improving the psychological symptoms. And finally, it's an uh, it's a enjoyable activity, for it's a pleasurable activity for people, uh, getting socialized and uh, dancing together and, f and actually forgetting that they have the disease and not thinking that they are attending a treatment, but they are just attending a dance class. That will give them some um, uh, motivation, happiness and psychological adjustment. Uh, so regarding the mechanism of act action uh, uh, re uh, of these uh, dance interventions, there are some research findings. Uh, so the uh, dance uses auditory, visual, and somatosensory cues that bypass the disease basal ganglia by utilizing different pathways. And also blood flow to the motor areas and the cerebellum increases when dance steps are performed. And also music-induced uh, state of mind increased the release of dopamine from the ventral striatum, which reduces the symptoms of anxiety and depression. So uh, I will show you this uh, small video clip, uh, which I was uh, fortunate to participate in these classes as well. It's getting beautifully cold. Which is if you'd like to stand up. Just listening to the music. People look at me and say, I'd never guessed you had Parkinson's because I don't have a tremor. I've been diagnosed for 10 years, but the last couple of years have been particularly challenging and it's getting more and more challenging. Best of Parkinson's is a community dance class for people with Parkinson's and their partners or caregivers or family members. We've been married for 47 years. We've been going um, since it started. For the dancing, it just takes the fear away from the falling over. In the consultation room, I often get on my soapbox and give a little lecture about the importance of physical activity, social interaction, mental stimulation, and dance of PD uh, gives all three of those. It's definitely helped with my walking. 
is and it's helped with my balance too. I'm certainly conscious of the fact that I don't get some of the movements a lot of the time and you know it doesn't matter and that's what's really nice and so you can look around and see that other people are getting the vibe and it's quite reassuring. I see all these inspirational people around me carrying on with life. So it's wonderful. It, it was that sense of being able to use your body in a way that wasn't like being a person with Parkinson's. Okay, so I hope you got an overview of what Dance for Parkinson's is. Um, so, um, uh, when talking about uh, the types of dance used in, uh, da in this Dance for Parkinson's program, uh, so usually there are a number of dance types used, such as tango, ballet, salsa, American ballroom, contact improvisation, Irish set dance, and uh, finally the Dance of Parkinson's program. So this Dance of Parkinson's program is, the, uh, is, is specially designed for the needs of people with Parkinson's disease. So one might think whether uh, uh, can a person uh, with a Parkinson's disease dance, but actually yes, because this, this program uh, uh, facilitates uh, people even on a wheelchair to come and participate in, on, in these classes. So this is specially designed for uh, people with Parkinson's disease. So we use this a special program in our research project uh, because we thought that the improvements would be higher because in, it incorporates all the uh, different types of dance and also uh, designed in a special way which facilitate the needs of people with this disease. So what are the techniques used in these classes? Uh, mirroring, internal imagery, tactile input, improvisation and sequencing. Uh, so, um, this uh, Dance of PD program was initiated in uh, 2001 in US by Brooklyn Parkinson's Group and Mark Morris Dance Group in New York. And over the past 20 years, this has uh, spread to different countries, inc including US, Australia, England, um, and India. And also, uh, the Dance of Parkinson's classes began in Australia in 2014, and we started this study in 2017 in Queensland University of Technology. So these are the research findings uh, uh, during the past years, uh, the re uh, details of the research. And um, this research show that there are a lot of beneficial effects on uh, people with Parkinson's disease in improving the motor and non-motor symptoms, as well as improving their emotional well-being and social well-being. However, uh, there are some deficiencies, there are gaps in the uh, previous studies, uh, such as there were limited randomized control trials, small sample size, no detailed data analysis, no detailed cognitive assessment, and so on. Uh, and there were a lot of uh, limitation in the objectively uh, measured outcomes. So therefore, we uh, designed uh, this uh, study uh, with the aim of uh, assessing the benefits of dance classes on gait and dual task gait, non-motor symptoms, functional mobility and fine manual dexterity, and health-related quality of life. So this clinical trial was a quasi experiment, had, a, had the quasi-experimental design with 17 in the dance group and 16 in the control group and was carried out in Queensland University of Technology. And the participants were recruited in numerous ways, including uh, talking to Parkinson's support group and, with that, and also with the assistance of Parkinson's Queensland Incorporated. So there were 46 participants assessed for eligibility at the beginning and they were allocated into dance and control groups. And finally, there were 17 people uh, remained for analysis in the dance group and 16 in the control group. 
so this intervention was um, uh, was a twice a week, uh, three months intervention, and uh, dance for PD trained instructors from Queensland Ballet uh, did the classes. And there were volunteers who are postgraduate students, undergraduate students, and uh, some from the community facilitating these classes. And then this was a one hour class with 30 minutes seated dance, 15 minutes standing dance, and 15 minutes progressive standing dance. And uh, friends, caregivers, family members were also encouraged to participate in these classes. Uh, there was an initial screening. Uh, following which the uh, people were divided into dance and control groups and there was a baseline assessment and then uh, one hour dance class twice a week for 12 weeks uh, were carried out for the people in the dance group and the uh, control group people were treated as usual and there was a pose, pose assessment. So uh, we used a very comprehensive battery of assessments uh, including measurements of disease severity, uh, gait, functional mobility, cognition, activity, and so on. So overall, after, after completing these classes uh, uh, regarding the safety, compliance, and attrition, so there was zero percent attrition rate. That means people who joined the classes were there in the classes till the uh, finish of the study. And then um, there was 92.89 attendance and there were no adverse events. So these are the uh, uh, demographic details of the participants of the both groups. So dance and control groups matched in terms of age, this is severity and cognition at the beginning. So when we uh, talk about the uh, uh, areas that we assessed, mainly gait and dual task gait. So this was assessed in the 3D motion laboratory uh, and we used two surfaces even and uneven surface. Um, so uh, the rec recording was done in the uh, gate lab and the participants were asked to walk at their normal pace uh, on even and uneven surfaces. So they were asked to walk regularly, the regular walking was assessed, as well as the dual task walking with a verbal fluency task and a serial subtraction task. A verbal fluency uh, task is uh, naming as many words as possible with a given letter while walking. And then serial subtraction task is subtracting um, uh, seven from a random three digit number, so which was really challenging. Uh, so this is what we found on um, even surface regular walking. A um, lot of uh, spatial temporal parameters had a significant improvement in the dance group, uh, the gait velocity, uh, stride length, uh, cadence, and step length. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, the dual task walking also, uh, there were improvements in gait velocity, cadence, and step length uh, on both verbal fluency and serial subtraction tasks. And um, walking on uneven surface, the regular walking did not improve. So um, uh, all the par parameters were uh, like we did not see any improvement. However, the dual task walking on uneven surface, uh, there were improvements in uh, serial subtraction task, the gait velocity, cadence, and step length in improved on uneven surface while subtracting numbers. Uh, so we confirmed, we concluded that uh, dance, ha dance has positive effects on selected spatial temporal parameters of normal walking and dual tasking on even surface. However, there were limited improvement on regular uneven surface walking. So um, what were the reasons for this improvement? So we, we thought that the improvements uh, were due to the attentional cues, the visual, auditory, and so somatosensory cues that the dance uses and also especially the music, which is acting a, as a very strong auditory cue, is effective for temporal processing and internal rhythmic timing of the gait. And dance involves a lot of dual tasking, which could be the reason for the improvement in the dual tasking. And uh, this is a, a study that was recently published on these uh, uh, results, and uh, you can have a look later. And uh, moving on to the other component, which is this is severity, functional mobility, and fine manual dexterity. 
Um, so we use the MDSU PDRS uh, to assess the disease severity. And then for the functional mobility, which include the assessment of gait balance, uh, we use TNET assessment tool, work balance scale, and mini best test. And uh, these are some of the functional tasks that we assess: the sitting balance, uh, single leg stance, single leg uh, stance, uh, standing on toes, and uh, standing on an inclined plane, uh, and so on. And the fun fine manual dexterity was assessed using the Purdue pegboard. So the participants were required to insert pins on the holes. Uh, uh, on the pegboard with the, the, uh, with the dominant hand and non-dominant hand. So uh, the results, uh, the disease severity which was assessed use, using the UPDRS, the UPDRS part one, part two, part three improved significantly. And then the functional mobility, uh, the time up and go test did not improve. However, the other test, the Tinetti, Berg Balance Scale and Mini Best Test improved significantly in the dance group. And regarding the fine manual dexterity, uh, the in inserting of the pins with the dominant hand improved and uh, making assemblies with both hands also showed a significant improvement. So we concluded that these classes uh, had uh, a clear benefit on disease severity, functional mobility and fine manual dexterity. And um, uh, there was, uh, uh, especially the UPDRS3, uh, which assessed the motor, motor, uh, motor uh, function, uh, showed a significant improvement. And, the, and that improvement was clinically significant, which we thought was a very important finding. And uh, the fine manual uh, dexterity, the improvement was, uh, so we, we thought that the improvements could be due to the improvement in hand uh, coordination movement patterns and reduction of rigidity due to the dance. And then the functional uh, mobility uh, uh, could have improved because of these functional movements in, included in these classes and also external uh, cues and also balance exercises embedded in these sessions. And this is again uh, another publication of us uh, regarding uh, uh, some of the important findings. So moving to the non-motor symptoms, uh, the cognition is the main, sim ma main um, area we assessed. It, uh, we assessed using the NIH toolbox, which is an iPad administered tool. Uh, which, and this has been validated in Parkinson's disease. Uh, so uh, the findings of the cognition, um, there were mixed results actually. Uh, so most of the cognitive skills did not improve. Uh, the, however, the executive, fu executive function improved significantly. The episodic memory, language, and processing speed did not improve. Uh, so we concluded that these classes have a mixed uh, results on, uh, on like, uh, have uh, benefits on selected cognitive skills, and the limited improvements uh, in cognition may be due to the higher level of cognition at the baseline, um, because the, both groups people were, uh, we excluded people with dementia, and both groups are well-educated, both groups had well-educated people. And also, um, de uh, depending on the time duration, the three months time duration may not be adequate, adequate for assessing or uh, to see an improvement in cognitive skills. Uh, and also the nature of cognitive skills assessed is also one, could be one of the reasons. And then habitual physical activity uh, was also assessed using um, accelerometer, which was attached to uh, the mid thigh. And the patient uh, had to wear the accelerometer for seven days, uh, pre and post uh, uh, classes, um, and the, this accelerometer assessed uh, the time they were sitting, uh, time they were standing, and time they were walking. So this shows this gra this uh, uh, shows the, in different colors the sitting, standing, and walking, uh, the time they spend at home. So uh, again, uh, the level of physical activity which is measured with the act active pal, we did not see a significant improvement. However, you can see there was a trend of improvement which is shown in the blue line. The dance group is the blue line. So there is a trend of improvement. However, this was not significant. 
but the uh, um, they, uh, we asked them to maintain physical activity diaries. However, we found improvement in the self-reported activity, but not the objectively assessed activity. So again, uh, uh, this could be due to uh, that the both groups are at a higher level of uh, physical activity, uh, relatively higher level at, uh, at the beginning because uh, we included people who are in the mild to moderate stage of the disease. So that could be one of the reasons. And uh, 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 health-related quality of life, which was assessed using the PDQ-39, uh, most of the subscales improved significantly. Um, such as uh, emotional well-being and cognition, um, and, and also the overall PDQ-39 showed significant improvement. So we conclude that dance classes based on these classes, are uh, based on dance PD model, has a significant impact on quality of life, and um, uh, the improvements could be due to the, uh, the friendly network of people that, uh, that are uh, associated with these classes, and they, uh, they have the feeling of community belonging and also the psychological adjustment. So this is again um, another publication uh, related to these findings. And overall, uh, these are the results. Uh, of this uh, study. So uh, the gate and dual task gate, uh, most of the spatial temporal uh, uh, parameters showed significant improvement, and especially the, in, in, uh, the improvement in the gate velocity was clinically significant. Um, and also we found improvement in functional mobility and quality of life. However, there were limited improvement in cognition and the objectively measured level of physical activity. So as future directions, uh, uh, we uh, would uh, uh, direct uh, the future researchers to replicate in more diverse sample of people with additional parallel groups and multiple assessment points uh, and to have follow-up assessment to see the durability of this result. So we want to know whether these results are durable. So therefore, we want to, it, it, would, it would be better to uh, see um, the assessment at different points uh, after completing these classes. And also transferable to daily life. So all these assessments were done in lab, 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 laboratories. However, we want to know whether this can be transferred into daily life. And also, uh, what sort of music that we can incorporate, what type of movement patterns that we can in incorporate it in, in these uh, sessions uh, could be uh, uh, further researched. And also durability and the cultural transferability, because this study was done in Australia. However, we would like to know how, uh, how we can um, transfer this uh, type of classes into Sri Lankan setting, maybe using Sri Lankan music and uh, Sri Lankan dance, which are more familiar to people. So um, this is also, again, a need to be further explored. So this is our team, including the patients with Parkinson's disease, dance teachers and the caregivers and uh, the instructors. Uh, and as an overall summary of what we discussed, uh, so conventional physiotherapy, uh, occupational therapy and uh, physiotherapy play an important role. So that is evident that these have a long history and they play an important part in the management process of Parkinson's disease as adjunct therapies to medication. And also there are some advanced techniques which have been appeared in the recent past, such as treadmill training, robot assisted gait training and virtual reality techniques. So due to the issues with long-term adherence and lack of enthusiasm, the community-based interventions have also appeared in the uh, past two decades. And they have uh, like past research shows that they also have uh, very uh, important benefits for Parkinson's and somewhat beyond the, beyond the benefits that we achieve in a traditional program. Um, and these are feasible and enjoyable alternative ways to achieve the same benefits. Uh, however, as I mentioned before, uh, the cultural transferability of these things, uh, how we can use this uh, uh, in our Sri Lankan setting, uh, would, would be, uh, that, that is important to investigate. And uh, how, dif how different management options act together, because this is a multidisciplinary op 
approach. So we need to find how different management options are acting together to provide the best possible outcome for the patients. And for that, we need to improve the awareness of the clinicians, the therapists, uh, to explain and direct patients for the most effective combination of management options. And uh, finally, the emphasis on the holistic management approach within the clinicians, therapists, as well as the caregivers, because the caregivers play an important role in um, lives of Parkinson's disease. So involving them in decision making and making them aware of what's happening is really important. And especially this type of community classes provide opportunity for the caregivers to come and uh, get socialized and get to know the other caregivers. And that is a really comfort for them as well. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, that is all for my presentation. So I'm happy to answer any questions if you have. Thank you very much, Nadisha, for that very interesting talk on uh, novel therapies. And uh, audience, if there are any questions, very interesting lecture. Nadisha, uh, have you got any plans of starting like a dance therapy class so we can, I'm a neurologist, so we can refer patients, you can start or getting with this Thai Chai, someone to volunteer. I think you don't need a physiotherapist to do the class. You need, might need volunteers to. Yeah, yeah. actually, uh, if we are doing this special program, which is Dance for Parkinson's, uh, we, um, we need to have a, a trained instructor. So even though I'm a physiotherapist, I need to have some training to do the classes because I'm not a dance instructor. However, like we have plans to start this really in this type of classes in the Sri Lankan setup. Um, but like... Uh, not definitely like where we are, like most probably in the university uh, clinic that we have at the moment, we have plans to start. Um, uh, but however, it would be nice to have uh, like ha have these classes and see how this is uh, working on Sri Lankan people. Like uh, we can include Sri Lankan dance and Sri Lankan music. Uh, yeah, so probably in the, uh, because we have the clinics uh, in the, the um, faculty of medicine, we use uh, the new building that we started. So probably we will be starting a class in near future. <laughs> because madam, I mean, this is cost free. And if you look at the medication costs, I mean, I mean, the dancing things and all. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, because the cost of medication is now going up and the availability and all. Yeah, and people might be more engaging in come once in two weeks, once a month. I don't know whether the expert committee can push for this to start maybe as a trial with maybe even those Thai Chai, there's a Sri Kalambu Thai Chai, I think, small mm -hmm. therapy unit or what do you call this? A dancing, uh, whether they can volunteer and do a class as a start. So I think we need to start for it to go on, I think. Yeah, that's true. Um, even small. Yes, that's true. So, so if uh, I mean, like, if anyone is interested in uh, doing uh, these classes, there are online courses available to become qualified as uh, dance or PD instructors. Because uh, to do this special program, we need to have that qualification. Otherwise, like, just uh, we can use. There are different dance types available. We can just do it. Um, but to do this. Uh, we need to be qualified, but uh, if anyone is interested in following a course, uh, online course, uh, you can contact me and I can give you further information on this. Thank you, Nadisha. It's one of the most interesting type of presentation for a neurologist, I think. The, uh, uh, there are so many questions in my mind, actually, that uh, particularly with regard to the question uh, arose by uh, Dr. Tamir. Actually, I think that it's it's in uh, the, the well, it's in his schools more than with you because the patients are with him. And as the way that we have started the uh, Stroke Patients Day, I mean, say once in every month in the uh, uh, National Hospital, the stroke patients gather together and then they uh, do activities so that that would sort of would be useful uh, physically as well as psychologically for patients. So uh, if the neurologists uh, could commence the, or they collect patients with Parkinson's disease and then uh, gather some uh, resource with the help of the 
and I think that uh, definitely into that would end up as a fruitful uh, activity. I just wanted to ask you that uh, what modification would you sort of have you thought of for the local setting for this type of an activity? Um, especially in terms of, I think, Madam, uh, the music and the dance that what, what do we need to use? Because we it's not very familiar, the, the music that we use is not very familiar to uh, patients in Sri Lanka. And also, um, I mean, to accept uh, being a dancer is also a challenge, even uh, like, because if it is a dance class, some people might come, but some people will be a little bit reluctant to come. So uh, so we need to have some sort of mod modification, obviously. And also, um, uh, of course, these classes are designed for any stage of people with Parkinson's. I mean, mild, moderate, and even severe, because we have seen people with a wheelchair coming to the class and just uh, dancing. So it's very, um, like they have given the freedom if they're happy to stand they can they can if they're happy to stand and walk they can do it but if we are if, if they are happy to be a seated dancer that is also appreciated so in that way it provides sort of a uh, like comfort, like people become more comfortable to come even with a severe stage of disease. So I think if we start these classes, the most important thing is uh, like we need to uh, have instructors because the instructors um, like they should have that uh, like um, like musicality, the rhythm in their body uh, to be an uh, instructor because physiotherapists, there are a lot of physiotherapists uh, in other countries who are dance instructors as well. Uh, so there may be people who are really interested in dance uh, and uh, even a physiotherapist or a clinician, whoever can do this. Uh, so that is also the who will be the teachers that has to, that has to be decided as well. Um, and also the type of music and the type of dance that we are going to use. So that is also a need to be decided. But I don't think it's a, chal a, a big challenge in terms of deciding that. And also we can uh, get the support from the experts from Australia as well to uh, if we are initiating this type of classes. Thank you. I saw in your research, it's 17 in the dance group, 17 in the control group. Yes. So maybe as a research project for someone, mm -hmm. you can encourage them to yeah. start it. And because 17 is not a difficult number to find. Yes, because I think here, uh, because I have done a Parkinson's disease research project when I was in Sri Lanka, uh, we have more, uh, like, uh, we can access to the uh, people with Parkinson's disease better compared to Australia because there are a lot of challenges uh, in hospitals they don't allow us to recruit participants over there so we had to go to Parkinson's support groups and recruit uh, patients but here I think uh, uh, people would be more interested and we could get uh, maybe a better number of participants if we start this as a research project. Anisha there's a question uh, from the uh, chat so what uh, that person is asking is whether uh, whether in dementia also could we use this sort of a uh, dance type of a therapy yeah yeah so there are research uh, in the area of dementia as well dance has been used not only in parkinson's but uh, dementia and other uh, uh, neurological disorders as well so this can be used in in, in dementia because especially this involves multiple cognitive skills and uh, the anxiety, depression, and declining cognition is there in um, dementia. So there are a lot of research in the field of dementia, and there are classes happening for dementia patients as well. Yeah, I think uh, I was just thinking because in my field, which is pediatric neurology, I was thinking about kids who are having uh, attention deficits and autism spectrum disorder and things like this while I was listening to your talk. I think that's a good eye opener. And I was just uh, suggesting whether you could get someone who's experienced in dance and you know the, that sort of music, whether you could you know show the the typical uh, music that you have used, whether they can yeah, get it uh, you know validated for Sri Lanka with yes. some sort of Sri Lankan music. I think that's yes. something that we could think about. Isn't yes, it? because especially even for our classes, we had uh, very closely we look at the type of music and uh, especially how this could facilitate the walking. Um, because upbeat music, there are research on using upbeat music as a um, uh, rhythmic auditory cue for uh, gait training. So here also we considered what sort of music would, would be uh, better in this type of classes. 
So uh, yeah, yeah, that's and that's yeah. In Sri Lankan uh, music, I suppose Baila would be a <laughs> nice cue just to move around, isn't it? And anybody would want to dance with the Baila, so I think that's something to think about. Anyway. Questions from the audience? Okay, so in the absence of any further questions, thank you very much for that very interesting lecture, thought provoking lecture. Uh, on behalf of the SLMA Expert Committee in Medical Rehabilitation, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Nadisha Kalyani for that very interesting and thought-provoking uh, talk in novel therapies uh, in Parkinson's disease rehabilitation, and especially dance as a therapy in Parkinson's disease rehabilitation. Thank you very much, Nadisha. Thanks a lot for all those who participated online as well as physical here. Thank you very much. Good afternoon.